The Ensemble podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. This content is created in partnership with our sponsor, Morningstar IM, ABN 54071808501, AFSL 228986, and FIL Responsible Entity Australia Limited, AFSL 409340, ABN 33148059009, and is limited to publicly available information. Before acting on any general advice, you should consider whether appropriate and obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Ensemble does not hold an AFS license and does not provide any financial advice or services or or endorse any general advice. If a PDS or IM exists, you should obtain a copy and review it thoroughly before making a decision. How are you now? And welcome to the Ensemble Investment Podcast. My name is James Whelan, Managing Director of Barclay Pierce Capital's Wealth Management Team, and I'm here to represent you, the humble advisor, doing their best to walk the line between client interests and asset class selection. We're trying to find the things that are not only appropriate, but that are actually working to be in the right things, the right time, the right way, for the right clients. So get set because myself and Morningstar are going to do our absolute best to answer some of the questions that have come up on the Ensemble platform. All information contained is general in nature. So here we go. Morningstar Investment Management Australia is delighted to be sponsoring Ensemble's investment podcast series designed to equip advisors to have more meaningful conversations with clients. Morningstar Investment Management is a global leader in asset allocation, investment research and portfolio construction. Specialising in investing, behavioural coaching and practice optimization. Morningstar strives to give advisors the tools to confidently navigate their clients' complex needs. Morningstar, empowering investor success. Fidelity has been investing globally for their clients for more than 50 years and 20 years here in Australia. With one of the world's largest investment research teams, they conduct more than 20,000 company meetings each year to uncover unique investment insights that others may miss. Fidelity offers a range of Australian, global and regional managed funds and you can also access their investment expertise through our active ETFs on the ASX. Invest with local insights, powered by global strength. How are you now and welcome to the Ensemble Investment Podcast, brought to you by Morningstar. My name is James Whelan, Managing Director of Barclay Pierce Capital's Wealth Management Team, and I'm here to represent you, the humble advisor, doing their best to walk the line between client interests and client asset selection. We are trying to find the things that are not only appropriate, but also that work, and maybe try and find the right time to be the right weight for the right clients, that beautiful holy trilogy. So... Get set because myself and Morningstar are going to do our best to answer some of the questions that have come up on the Ensemble platform, and obviously all information contained is general in nature. Here we go. Also, don't forget to keep on putting more questions and more comments in through the Ensemble platform. The best we can do is represent you, and that is how we do it the best. It is no secret that Australia, like much of the Western and Chinese world, has an aging population. In 2020, Australia's population over 65 was 14%. Now that number is 32 It's not, actually, but I just wanted to see if anyone was paying attention. Actually, by 2026, that number is expected to be around 22%. That's still significant. And whilst it may be the foundation of a multitude of boomer jokes, from an investment standpoint, it poses one heck of a problem. I can tell you from personal experience that is the case. But where there is a problem, there is also opportunity. But where is that opportunity? How can we capture it? Is it worth doing? And how do we communicate that particular opportunity to all and sundry. Now, I couldn't ask for two better names to help discover this with than those two with me right now in the studio. Matt Weicher, CIO for Asia Pacific at Morningstar, joins me to help steer the ship today, and there is quite a bit to work through. Matt, how are you now? I'm good, thanks, Jimmy. Yeah. Uh, and joining us from Fidelity International is Lucas de Pobay. Lucas is the Global Cross Asset Specialist at Fidelity International and will be helping us out with questions on strategy, demographic trends. I just made some stuff up. And anything else that comes up? Lucas, how are you now? Very well. Okay. Now, everyone gets the same question um, when they come in. doesn't matter who you are or what you look like. Uh, fortunately, you you are you and you look like you, so that makes it a lot easier. But the... Uh, I don't know what that means. Uh, it, we might just cut that out, Kieran. Thanks. Uh, the, <laughs> uh, it, provides some, it, does, it does provide a little bit of context for uh, for what we're talking about. Everyone gets to say one. Um, what do you do and how do you make money? Lucas. So I work closely with our global investment teams. Um, we are obviously an asset manager, global investment manager, uh, managing money across asset classes. Uh, and I help get that message out to the market as well as uh, help develop the product set for the Aussie market. Not a bad answer at all. Matt, I've got to ask you the same question. Sure. I'm a Chief Investment Officer for Asia Pacific, which means we run some uh, multi-asset portfolios, SMAs, managed funds 
um, across asset classes, risk profiles in, in the region. We work with the global investment team at Morningstar to do that. Excellent. Well, okay, look, let, let's try and do this the, the way that we usually do. I've had some really good positive feedback that the way that, that, that these are structured is working out quite well. So if, uh, if you go with me, we'll sort of try and start on a wide view, um, open up the lens uh, as widely as we can, what's going on in the world, and then we'll start to sort of focus down more into how it relates to what we're talking about. Now, what we're talking about is is this aging population that we have and uh, what's called longevity risk. So we'll get into that in just a moment with where the with what longevity risk is all about but let's start with you lucas what are you seeing out in the world i mean maybe not with the specifics of what date it is but let's just go with this sort of generally what are you seeing out in the economy right now yeah look it's uh it's much of the same as in the the dialogue is a lot continues to be around inflation uh and where that is heading um i guess the main uh thing we're we're focused on at the moment is is that battle between this narrative of Soft landing and a narrative of, of no landing. So soft landing is, I guess, the the Goldilocks environment, which is one where moderation uh, inflation is moderating, where um, growth is slowing, but but you know gradually, uh, and we're getting back into target in terms of uh, monetary policy. Um, however, um, more and more we are seeing evidence of, of a no landing, which means actually that um, inflation is sticky. Mm. Uh, we're getting a bit of maybe reacceleration of the economy. So there's there's this sort of battle at the moment between the two, which is um, causing uh, I guess Marcus to gyrate every time there's <laughs> the, the the view oscillates between the two. So when you get that sort of soft landing, the market's going up. When there's well maybe inflation's a bit stickier, um, then you know markets get the wobbles again. So that's sort of the environment we're in at the moment. Uh, I guess from a fidelity perspective, we are still uh, in the in the supplanting camp, mm. um, but but we're we're really watching things like the labour data, for example, which 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 is still sort of looking a little bit elevated. Yep, no worries. Thanks very much for that. Do, do we want to talk about Asia, China at all? If anyone wants to put put their hand up about that one, then go for it. I I, I noticed that you've got Asia Pacific in your title, so I Matt, it's gonna be it's, it's gonna <laughs> be uh, uh, in Tokyo story. last week. But China, yeah. I mean we. We think that uh, you know, if you can stomach the risk for a small size position in in a portfolio, there's some some opportunities to to pick through China. We we uh, we like some of the tech names there. Um, certainly not large positions in our portfolio, but but I mean, how China affects um, Australia is probably a key uh, risk factor here. I think, and and you know, if growth continues to disappoint there, or you know, or, or reaccelerates. So that's going to have a big. Either way, that's going to have a big effect on the Australian economy. I think yeah. that that there's lots of risk there at the moment, and and you need to be prepared for kind of both scenarios. In terms of the actual stocks that we hold, we think that they're pretty good value at this point in time. China, um, the Chinese, Chinese China. stocks, especially relative to to kind of the rest of the world, which I uh, think is a little bit overvalued. Yeah, that a current without putting it like I said, without putting a data. Generally speaking, that the differential between China Chinese valuations and US valuations is the biggest spread that I've seen in. Mm. Well, that yeah. that chart that I looked at went back a long way. Yeah, yeah. So it's it's, it's a big old spread. So yeah. that which is. Funny. Now we'll come back to China in just a second. So I was, oh, maybe I'll, I've, I've, I've got a bit too soon with the segue. I just want to cut it. What else are you seeing in the market at the moment, Matt? Let's- Look, I mean, it's a bit disconcerting. We're kind of contrarian by nature, but but we're kind of in the soft landing camp as well. And I guess everyone's there, which is why it's disconcerting for a contrarian. Hey, fair. Um, but you know, at the same time, you know, I think valuations, apart from China. Uh, are reasonably stretched, uh, you know, in in lots of areas, and so we we tread with caution there. We, you know, it's not a it's not you know a complete risk off environment. There's still opportunities out there, but but we think that um, you need to tread pretty cautiously around some of those uh, names that are a bit extended at this point in time. No worries at all. Okay, well, if we start to sort of drill it drill it a little bit now, part of the reason why China maybe some of the tremors that were coming out of China was was just based on that decreasing population. It hit its it hit its heights. Um, if the, the Asian population, obviously having a, the one-child policy that China had for such a long time, that was seen to be problematic. I suppose I want to say for the Chinese economy, as as it were. The, is, is, do you think that that is as spread around the Western world as as it has been seen and affected in China, or was it just earlier in the Western world and we didn't see it to the same same magnificence as, as it's been pointed to in the Chinese condition? You're both going to get a go now because you both hesitated, so it's okay. I got to go, Lucas. Yeah. Lucas is going to go me first. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Look, we, it, it's it's not a new thing. So I mean, if you th- 
think of other other uh, geographies. I mean, Japan's the classic example where you know the the aging demographic has been a trend there. I think I think I don't know if this is actual fact, but there was uh, it's well, whether it's an urban myth, but. I remember listening to to a podcast, not this one, another one, <laughs> yeah. and um, and uh, it was a, a stat that, or something to the, the effect that the um, the number of nappies sold in Japan is uh, adult nappies, yeah, exceeds that of uh, uh, children's yeah. nappies, which which is very sort of symptomatic of the aging population. Yeah. But look, you know, other, you know, certainly if you look at uh, Europe. Um, you know similar issues, uh, so so the age in and Australia to a degree as well. I guess the, the difference is you know Australia and then in particular the states is is the migration coming in, which which is uh, assisting in those demographics. Yeah. Now, Matt, you had something to say on that. Oh, I was going to say I think yeah. Currently, the microscope is on China, but as uh, as Lucas said, there's you know it, it's been an experience through a range of different regions, and and Australia is no different apart from migration. Yeah. Um. You know, I think that that Japan's a, a good example. It, it seems it's finally got some inflation back there in Japan, which is actually a good thing there. So so these things potentially don't last forever. They may last for a long time though. Yeah, that they do. And I suppose in Australia's case, we have we have the tap of immigration that can that can be turned on and and, and squeezed and throttled based on however we want to play the game here of the millions of people who want to come out to this amazing country of ours. Um, that sort of can get us a little bit out of that. Japan never really had that uh, that, mm. that option, did they? So for a whole host of other different reasons. Now that sort of takes us into talking about this aging population, and, and we will talk about. So the, the overarching theme is engaging retiree clients in investing in a, and addressing longevity risk. Let's just try and get some some framework around this. Um, longevity risk, how do you define it um, and how, how do you want to be talking about it today? Matt, we'll, we'll kick off with you. I, I think longevity risk is really the risk of outliving your savings, outliving your retirement savings. And then, you know, Australia is lucky we've got the age pension that you can rely on. But, but you know, if, if it wasn't for that, you'd end up with nothing and, and you'd be struggling to live. That's, that's longe- longevity risk in a nutshell. Yep. No worries. That. And Lucas, you're okay to, uh, oh, happy to, to go with that. To discuss in those terms. That's good. <laughs> well, that works for me as well, which, which is a good way of going about it. I, I do know that I've got some people who are, and without naming them, in, in my life that have just, that have come to me over the years and have just said, James, I physically can't live past X date. Thank you. I physically can't live past X days. I hope we pick that up. That, uh, that, 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 that's, just, that, that's just the point at which I, I don't know what I'm going to do after this stage. That is a really difficult conversation to have with, with actual real, I mean, friends of family, but also having that conversation with clients and how you, how you get around that. Now, the, let's, let's just launch straight into the questions that we've got here from Ensemble. The first one, how can I provide clients with a level of security so that they are comfortable spending in retirement knowing they will have enough to last them. Yeah, I'm- yeah. <laughs> I really should have put a name on that, but I, I think I mean that, that, that's that that really is the biggest question that's, yeah. that's going to be on there, right? How can I how can I help provide clients level of security? Yeah, so that they are comfortable, and that's why I sort of let that pause hang out there because that hangs out. Yeah, that, that's the crux of the entire conversation, right? No, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I mean, I think to start with, I mean, I think Australia, we, you know, we we do have that safety net of the age pension now. Obviously, that's not what the ultimate goal is is just to live in the age pension, but. But there is that safety net, right? So that that is certainly there. Um, but ultimately, it's 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 really a a, a a trade-off between people what type of lifestyle they want to live, and at the same time, what are their assets and and yeah. and 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 what are, you know what are their objectives? I guess in in retirement, and that's that's where it gets tricky because there's you know there's heaps of sort of rules of thumb in terms of how much income you should draw down, like the four percent rule, for example. Um, but in in reality, it's down to the individual and what the expectations are, and what can they uh, can their funds last? And I think I think the the challenge is that people we are living longer generally, so that money has to last longer. And so then there's a tension point between security, i.e., I'm just going to put the money in the most secure asset, cash, for example. Mm. Um, Versus and 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 that yes you'll be secure but you'll run out of money right because that money's not growing anymore because you, you you you're drawing down income yep. versus maybe I need to take on more risk potential for that to grow uh, but there's risk with that right so there's there's this tension between objectives and a tension between uh, risk and return do you think that do you think that clients especially the older demographic have 
in taking on potentially too much risk while we went through the zero the zero interest rates era of recent years? Uh, or the low interest rate era of recent years? Pretty, pretty much everywhere since the GFC till COVID was, mm. was just this strange, bizarre ghost world of, of, of low rates. Yeah, so that was a challenging environment for retirees, right? Because if, if you're a retiree and, and you're living off, off income, zero interest rates uh, is not great. Mm. Um, I mean, roll forward today and, and interest rates are a lot higher. So, so interestingly, in this environment, it's been a, a much better environment for retirees because generally, you know, that the, generally they don't have debt, they're not paying off a mortgage and interest rates are higher. So, therefore, uh, that's a better environment for for retirees. Matt, you're not- yeah, no, I was going to say, especially we 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 think inflation's falling. Um, it may be stuck. Oh, it's about to mention. But real, I think yeah, with positive real rates, it's a really attractive, a reasonably attractive uh, environment for retirees to yeah. be operating in. I think you know we think about you know th- th- this whole concept. It is a series of trade offs, um, and at the same time. You know, people's utility. We think of it in terms of utility, and it, that's different. So, people's needs and wants um, are all different. And then, so people might want to leave an inheritance. People might want to, uh, you know, uh, make a donation at the, or a uh, bequest, etc. At the end of their life. But really, the, the the main aim, and this is a bit morbid, the ideal would be to spend your last dollar on the last day you live. So, uh, <laughs> you know, it, getting that balance right is really a, a series of trade offs, and that's- and it's a complex problem. It's 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 always been an interesting conversation to have with, with clients, especially when when developing plans and portfolios for people who are saying that this is a plan that this takes you to their last day. Mm. And yeah, it's 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 if you're not if there's a lot of people who are who aren't comfortable having that conversation, so uncomfortable in fact that they won't even they won't even complete a will because yeah. they just don't want to assess it. And so like if you can't if you can't if you can't come to terms with the fact that that's going to come to a, a at a point at one stage that the inevitability of it that it affects us all is going to come to a stage. It's very difficult to then create a plan around the entire thing. And I think that some people genuinely would just rather not have that. Mm. So it's a, it's a, it's it's each to their own, I suppose. Yeah, it's okay. Yeah, isn't it? um, okay. So, so we'll keep on going now um, just on that. It is a bit morbid, isn't it, Matt? <laughs> but I, but I, th- I think that, but like I said, it's a conversation you've got to have. Yeah. It's 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 the same. Left, you know, it's the social advisors than us investment guys. It's tough out <laughs> there, mate, to do to have that conversation. Uh, uh, amazingly, though, I do have some clients that are just straight up with it and have no yeah. problem conversating about the entire thing and saying, "This person, I, I, I need this person to get looked after. I need these things to happen as if it's going to happen." And, and and there's a lot of the time when you're having this conversation, saying, "You know, this is probably going to be about seventy or eighty years away." So the conversation that we're having. I mean, you're going to be. How do you? Yeah. It's just, I think, just general people in general, like the concept of trying to manage a risk that's twenty years out. Like we're not hardwired as really mm. to think about things that way. Right? Yeah. Even the actuaries will tell you, you know, like it's just not the way we think, mm. right? So, so I think saying to someone, well, you know, you've got this thing called longevity risk, that may be whatever twenty, thirty years, whatever the number is. Yeah. <clears throat> it's hard for people to manage for something that feels so far away. I, it's the the strangest thing that's going to be coming up, and I'm going to be speaking about this a little bit more in the in future months, and maybe I'm not sure over the years. Is that we have to come to the yeah generally generally I can assume that my kids are going to live past 100. That's that's pretty much that's I think that we can generally assume the medical conditions and healthcare everything the way that it is, and just generally that the evolution of the species that they'll live past their 100. I think that the way that that changes the way that that changes the financial plan is is mm. significant. Being able to look at that. From especially with the way that financial services have moved, this is actually an interesting conversation. The way that financial services have moved in the last, say, ten or twenty years, to be able to, you know, here is a plan, and here's what we're actually going to do with with the with the assets that people couldn't have an investment in before. Even the bond market was was a place where people couldn't really have much exposure to it unless you went through an actual proper fund. And now you can have someone who's very young being able to have a plan that potentially has you know eighty years in the future, and you can plan mm-hmm. for that. You know, really well, especially now. Take out what an Austrian eighty-year bond or whatever it is that you want to take, and that is, and lock, lock that in, and and that'll come to fruition when you know receive full value, full value when you're. At, when you, oh, I just thought it. There you go. Plus the cohort. Of, I mean, I, I don't know. Can't remember some stat around this, but I guess that cohort of people that have actually been within the superannuation system mm-hmm. now for is coming through right? yeah so so that's that's that has an impact as well you've you, you do have a larger base of people yeah. with with this nest tag i guess that have to now think about okay what happens what does that, that look yeah. like right well 10 years ago that had 
20 years of that experience. Now they've got 30 years yeah. and in 10 years time, it'll be 40 years of that superannuation experience. So, yeah. Yeah. It's, it's a, it's a, it's a big change. What does happen? I mean, we've always said uh, this, is, like I'm going off the cuff here, but yeah. there's some fascinating stuff that's going on here. There's, there's always, it was PJ O'Rourke, who's one of my favorite authors, um, that wrote that always for, for the, uh, in the financial system, always just do what the boomers do. When the boomers need to buy, everything goes up and the boomers need to sell, everything goes down and comes off. What happens when, I mean, we are coming to a stage now where people of my parents' generation, it's started to come to a real sort of conclusion potentially that you're born in the 40s, then maybe this is now the time and you have to start thinking about it's coming to the end. What do you think is actually going to happen and what what's, is there anything, is there any remedy for what potentially is going to happen with the disposal of assets or the transfer of wealth? Well, I, th- I mean, I think that, that in terms of growth assets, the younger generations need to buy them. That that's for sure. And and there may be, you know, um, not a fire sale, but but there'll be lots of assets out there that they need to buy. I think one of the other things with this whole discussion is that people's um, propensity to be risk averse is shines through, and so really changing that mindset, that that behavioural dynamic, and trying to get people to take on more risk to to combat this longevity risk is something that it's a real challenge out there. I think, but. You know the, the the younger generations, as you point out, are really going to need to to be doing that as they live longer. Um, and and you know, I think the boomers, yeah, that that will come to an end. Um, but at the same time, there's going to need the, the, there's going to be more asset, more cash available to purchase some of those assets. That superannuation story is is a big one. Certainly, hope so. Lucas, do you see any hiccups with the transfer, the impending transfer? Look, not sort of specific. I mean, I think the interesting one is that, yeah, in terms of that retirees and I guess speaking to different financial planners as well is is actually getting to spend as well because I think to, to Matt's point is like there's a, there's a risk aversion and people get to that retirement phase and it's like batting down the hatches and, and we're not spending now yeah. and, and get really, you know. So, look, it is going to be interesting. I mean, obviously, there's a lot of debate around property, what's going to happen there and, and, and all of those things. But, you know, is there going to be some big, Moment, look, I don't, I don't think so. I don't think there's going to be some, you know, massive fire sale of assets, so to speak, because, you know, you also are seeing a lot of sort of transfer of wealth while now the re- the retirees are still alive, right? Yeah. So it's not, it's, it's you know, that day comes and suddenly there's a fire sale. I think there's that you are seeing that yeah. transfer of wealth happen. And, and I, I, I think that Japan probably did has set. That there was that, that there has been no that there's just a different change in the way the demographic mm-hmm. that that demographic buys things. That's right. Yeah, they don't buy new stuff. They yeah. they they buy very small cars, mm-hmm. and that's pretty much just mm-hmm. the way that 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 shift yeah. that that shift kicks on. I'm speaking of that. So economic conditions. So and we have touched on this, but we've got to get the get the question out of there officially because there's a bit in here about property as well. So what impact are current economic conditions? And we can we could go really local for this one as well. What impact are current economic conditions having on longevity risk? I.e. Inflation, interest rates, property prices. Now, property prices is an interesting one to launch off on this one. I mean, property prices have continued to go up. Yeah. Like, like this, this, that, yeah. it's sort of interesting because despite the sort of um, the rate hikes and, you know, the, the, you know, 12 months ago. In spite of everything. In spite of everything. So, people were talking about the, 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 the cliff that was coming in terms of, you know, fixed rate um, mortgages uh, reverting to sort of the variable rate. Now, that. You know, if you look at the data coming through from the banks, for example, in terms of you're not you're not getting those massive spike up and default rates. Now, part of that is um, employment is really strong. Mm-hmm. So, despite rate rises, th- despite sort of cost of living going up, uh, people have jobs. Uh, people are confident that they can if they lose their job, there'll be another job. Mm-hmm. So, while that's at play, you know, the things things like property prices have continued to sort of uh, generally go up. Yeah. yeah, yeah. You got anything on property? Well, it's, I mean, that's obviously a positive. I think the key risk from along. I don't have too much on property. I don't know where it's going, but I think the key risk um, is if if they do slow down migration um, and to to property prices, that's going to potentially um, put a bit of a uh, slow down there. And then at the same time, you know, if um, inflation remains sticky and they have to, to continue to raise rates, that's uh, that's obviously going to be a negative as well. Yep. Yeah, and I. I think it is. It's funny, just sort of how sticky that all is. I, I'm looking forward to a time when we don't have to talk about it every single time that we talk about anything. <laughs> With any stuff that I do, it's always just a thing that's coming yeah. up. The the other thing that's really not discussed is the fact that inflation. We talk about the inflation growth, 
So it's a year on year, quarter on quarter that, that, that it's growing. It's just like, oh, great, that inflation is slowing down. It's still, the cost of things has still actually gone up mm. quite significantly. Mm. And that's that big, that big, I'm, I'm using my hands gesticulating here for anyone who's not listening because there's no way of discussing a year on year inflation figure without using your hands. The same as the yield curve, you've got to do it with sort of bending mm. your hands around. Mm. But the, um, the, <laughs> you, know, you know that for a fact, don't you? I don't. Uh, the, to the, um, that, yeah, the, the, the cost of things have actually gone up. And I suppose that, that having a property price, having, Having a property valuation that's higher that does allow you potentially a little bit more wiggle room with regards to what you can do with your assets and, the, mm. and your and your buying power and borrowing power. Yeah, um, I think one of the interesting things is if you look at the sort of the Australian market and you sort of divide it, you can divide it really into three cohorts, right? You've got the the retirees um, that have paid off their house. You've got the, the 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 middle cohort, which is I guess people that have got a mortgage, and then you've got the third cohort is people that are renting. Mm. Now, the latter two obviously are feeling, you know, higher rates and, and so forth. But if retire, if you look at sort of consumer behavior um, at the moment, I mean, the retirees are spending, yeah, right? They've got money yeah, and they're spending, you know, whatever going on cruises, whatever, you know, there's money out there, right? Yeah. So, um, so it's quite interesting in, in it, it is very specific to the cohort you're in. But as, as we sort of spoke, spoke about earlier, the, the higher cash rates- uh, people with the savings, people with low debt, actually, it's not a bad environment. And the markets have been doing pretty well. Yeah. And property prices have been going up. Yeah, so, it's, it's been great for the boomers. Yeah. So, what do we raise all the rates for? It hasn't worked. So, it hasn't worked. It hasn't actually slowed down the. It hasn't slowed down the spending of the of the people with the most amount of cash. Yeah, I mean, you've seen, you have seen. Uh, I feel sorry. Yeah, no, no, you have seen inflation. <laughs> you have seen in, inflation go up. It actually, it was an interesting. It, there's a bit of a delay, though, in terms of household and spending because the consumer is sort of interesting. I mean, I'd be sort of getting more into the nitty-gritty in the market stuff. But, you know, the consumer has been resilient generally, not just the retirees. Generally, mm-hmm. even if you look at consumer stocks out there in the market, like, they've surprised mm-hmm. to the upside. So, households are still spending. Now, whether that's a that's just a delay mm-hmm. in terms of the high interest rates really making their way through um, the system, there, there is an argument for that. But there's an interesting... Statex, actually one of our portfolio managers brought up the other day was that if you look at um, uh, travel, travel agencies, for example, so corporate travel actually has declined, right? So the corporates are sort of watching the balance sheets a little bit more, watching costs. Households haven't got there yet. Household spending on travel is just still going up, right? So I don't know whether there's – but there's an interesting sort of uh, juncture there. So, so, you know, the question is, look, if if we do get – I think to Matt's point, if there's a higher for longer environment in terms of rates being higher for longer, that will start to have a much more meaningful impact on households compared to where it has at this point. Well, then, if, but and then if we are talking about longevity risk, I suppose that that a higher a higher for longer savings rate, and then obviously a bond market that is still going to be returning something something amazing compared to what it has done in the past. So you don't have to take as much risk to get to get the same return. It it's sort of it sort of takes away it takes away more of that longevity risk that 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 has been out there. I think, Brooke, sorry, sorry, I was going to say. I think the key risk to that is is where inflation's actually at. Like, if if inflate if you're not earning a really significantly positive real return, then you're going backwards. So now, what do, do we actually want to talk about? Any specifics on real return and 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 allocation? I know that potentially that would be your Matt potentially. Yeah, look. I mean, in, at the moment in our multi-asset portfolios, you know, we, we're, um, you know, we're, we're quite positive on bonds, even though yields have come down that, the, the, you know, from from where they were sort of October last year. That yep. that, that was a, a pretty good bond rally. Having seen a few over the years, that was that was an impressive one. But you know, yields around you know four to four and a half percent. You know, we, we think are, are reasonably attractive. Not let's not go out and buy at as much duration as we can, but let's let's have some on board. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know, I think that the bond yields around this level, you know, actually uh, they make risk taking kind of you have to you have to get paid for the risk that you take, and so it's a, it's a good environment for a multi asset investor. You can find a few opportunities. Um, you know, bonds are providing that diversification benefit again, um, and you know, equities are you know they're, they're not terribly attractive, but there's pockets of value there as well. Yeah, not bad. And if we're talking about portfolio construction, do you want to go on with that, Lucas? Yeah, look, I, 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 I'll sort of tend to agree. I mean, I think I think if you sort of 
cast your mind back a couple of years ago where, where you know, interest rates were zero, close to zero. Uh, in that environment, like, the only real option you have was, was to be risk on, right? Because yes. you weren't being paid to hold bonds. Mm-hmm. Um, to get any type of return, you had to be in growth assets. Whereas today, it, it, it is a slightly different environment. You know, bond yields have gone up. Um, you are getting paid to hold bonds. I, I guess from our perspective, I mean, you know, we, we, we are still, I guess, in that soft landing camp. So, we've, we've probably got a little bit of a bias towards equity still. Mm-hmm. Uh, but agree with Matt, it is it is far m- much more of a you've got to be more, much more selective in terms of your security selection in this environment compared to an environment of zero rates where everything goes up, right? Oh, yeah. Now, I, Lucas, I have done a little bit of a search on you and said some interviews you've done in the past. Now, without going single stock, are you seeing any sort of sectors or anything that might be interesting just going forward? We're, we're obviously talking long-term here because we are, we are talking yeah. about longevity risk. We're talking about what sort of portfolios people should have, you know, I guess for the, for, for the next 20 or 40 years it's on there. So what- what sort of sectors would be would be a good area to capture that long term area? And yeah. if, you say, if you say the Magnificent Seven, then I'm going to switch, <laughs> switch your microphone off because yeah. trust me, it's right. <laughs> so okay. the Magnificent Seven. No, no. <laughs> no, it's um, <laughs> no, look, I mean, I guess it, look, it's very hard to, I mean, from from an active manager perspective, to take a sort of you know thirty plus view on a sector is difficult. But look, certainly. More broadly, if you sort of think about, there are certain sectors that will probably benefit from uh, from some of this aging population type of phenomenon. So, obviously, healthcare uh, is is one of those mm. uh, as an example. Um, um, so, so there's certain you know certainly those sectors are, are there, um, but but really, I guess from our perspective, we are very much looking at sort of. The, next, the shorter term in terms of sort of three years out, next 12 months to three years in terms of what that market dynamic is looking uh, looking like. And and I guess what we're seeing at the moment is that the market has rallied really hard. I mean, there's certain sectors. We've mentioned technology as an example that's gone really hard. Yep. Um, so, you probably need to be a little bit cautious in terms of because those valuations are starting to look rich uh, and, and may con- maybe, you know, continue for some time. But but at the same time, you probably need to have a bit more discipline because, you know, some of these parts of the market are looking stretched. Yeah, yeah. Did you want to talk about? I mean, if we're talking, I mean, again, we might as well yeah go down this path. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think that the, yeah, as you've probably heard already, I, I kind of agree that parts of the market, particularly tech, are looking a bit stretched. I think that looking at those um, second derivative plays from AI, I think you know, even banking and financial services, consulting, etc. You know, they could be long-term winners out of this because they're going to cut out a lot of cost yep. um, in terms of uh, you know, productivity gains with, with AI. Yep. I don't know that that's actually been priced yet, certainly not to the extent that it's been priced into NVIDIA. Um, but uh, but only it hasn't been yet. Well, that's right, yeah. <laughs> but, but, you know, I think that, that they're, for, from a very long-term perspective, looking at some of that is, is interesting. It's very hard to get a real handle on that at this point in time as well, or what's actually going to happen. Yeah. No, I've, I've heard that very similar. Pricing has not yet transferred or not yet been shared by the adopters. It's been the creators of AI, mm-hmm. and now it's, well, we, had to, we had to mention AI, I suppose, it's a podcast. <laughs> you can't get three dudes get in a room. You can't, <laughs> can't get three dudes in a room with microphones uh, and not talk about artificial yeah. intelligence, Kenny. So, the, um, the, yeah, it's, it's, the, the adopters have, have had their run, and now it's time – sorry – the creators have had their run. Now it's time for the adopters to show how much they can start to stretch this one out and be able to maximise, especially in a, in a tight margin environment that we have that we have seen with higher inflation um, and just generally higher costs of all sorts of things yeah, that have gone and higher labour costs too. That your margins do get squeezed, which I guess is why corporate travel has just taken such mm-hmm. a hit because you're more price sensitive. Um, but if you can start to save some money on that, then you might start to see that that ease up. Ease up some cash for some other things you want to. Well, do. you've even seen some of these big tech companies cut People. staff aggressively, yeah. right? Mm. And and these weren't jobs that were sort of, you know, these were sort of technical jobs as well. Um, so it's quite interesting that yeah. you know you, you you've seen you've seen that sort of kick off already. Yeah, um, Matt, what's do, do you have a really good long term sort of area with with without you know sort of so stepping away from that tactical sort of area? What 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 is a good long term asset to hold to, to try and I mean, and what's and so this is probably a cop out, but I mean, <laughs> you know, if you can get quality at a reasonable price, then then like quality stocks, um, 
then you know the, not too much goes wrong there. You know, probably Berkshire Hathaway, Warren Buffett has has uh, you know made all these millions doing something similar to that. And I, I don't think you can go too wrong there. Um, but but you don't want to overpay for quality. I think that's where you can come unstuck. And but but I think you know quality type assets, healthcare assets, as Lucas said. I think there's there's some value there at the moment, and I think that there's you know uh, long term dynamics that we're talking about. That that's another area that I think is is reasonable. And then yeah, the, again, those second derivative kind of uh, AI plays may offer some opportunity if anyone can work it out what's actually going to happen. But yep. uh, we haven't done that yet. Well, here's, there's a good question that I've got. Thank you for that, Matt. Um, yeah, perfect. The, yeah, I haven't figured that out either. But the, uh, how can retiree clients be provided with investment control so that if they want to remain invested in retirement, they can, i.e. access to funds in an emergency, hmm. living legacy inheritance for, for, for a child, et cetera? Do we want to try and just figure that out? Now, I know that we're not the, the, the technical on the hand or oh. the tools guys that are actually being able to figure this out, but I think that with the sort of things that you can be invested in might change the perspective of that. You need to be able to have – I think that there's a lot of sort of – no, it's, I'll, I'll let anyone, anyone speak that wants to talk about this one. I think we've, we've done a fair bit of work, um, you know, trying to help advisors with uh, cash flow modelling and those sorts of things. And I think a bucketing type strategy is something that they can look to do. So you might have a, a growth bucket with a 10-year time horizon that you can hold really – I guess long-term assets um, doesn't mean you don't ever sell them, but but if you do sell them, you might want to roll them down into a cash bucket, um, which gives you that 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 kind of at call liquidity. Um, so if if there is a market dislocation, you don't have to necessarily sell assets. You can actually potentially buy some more. And, and we've actually explored also having a mid-term bucket, especially with bond yields where they are now, where you can have you know some liquidity, but but it's really. Uh, um, you know, it's it's more a medium term type bucket. Um, you can take some money out of there and put it into cash. If if you're earning some income in there, again, can just sw- sweep it and put it in the cash bucket. But the key thing, for, and from a longevity risk perspective, is having that long term uh, bucket that you don't need to touch um, unless the market's done really well, and then you can rebalance. I think rebalancing is a key tool in that kind of approach as well. Yep, yep. and th- that that does provide more control. Access to funds in an emergency, yeah, all those things that, that, that are there, and actually having that bucket, but actually being being stringent on that bucket and keeping That's an eye right. on those things is, is yeah. going to be the most important thing. Lucas, yeah, no, look, I'd agree. I mean, I think that concept of, of effectively, you know, if if you think about that mental accounting sort of concept, and then people, you know, generally do do that, right? So. Um, you know, if it's short-term liquidity, uh, then obviously that's going to have a very different risk profile compared yeah. to a, a, a long-term, you know, a long-term goal, which which um, that may be your growth mm-hmm. bucket, for example. So, um, so I think once you get that framework where you can sort of say, well, you know, here's the top three things, maybe where whether there's a bequest or whether it's mm-hmm. a holiday, whatever it is, right? Like, but, but being able to compartmentalize that yeah. and then sort of say, well, okay. Here's your, here's your sort of safe money. Here's your sort of long term growth money, and here's sort of money to meet your cash flow. However you do it, but but that 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 is a way of at least having a framework. Uh, and then it's about discipline. I mean, talking to a lot of advisors, I think the, the interesting one is the, the the one thing that generally derails all all of these plans is that unexpected spend. Mm. So so it's 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 the framework's there, but then you know your client maybe comes in and you know they they. They want to buy a new car. Well, they bought a new car, yeah, and that wasn't in the plan, right? Yeah. So, so yeah, I had a client so, buy a bull. <laughs> yeah. Actually, that was a funny yeah, conversation. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so no, okay, that, then it was a it was a forty thousand dollars. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it, I think that's the challenge for the advisors, isn't it? Like it's it's sort of you can have a plan, but then then it's how do you help your clients stick to it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> One of the key things that I forgot to say when I was talking about rebounds is that you're in a tax-free environment as well, so you can take right. you know some money off the table if you need to, and, yep. and move things around. It's- so, I mean, making sure that you are structured in the right structure that you should be, uh, without right. going too specific into because yeah. then that moves into the advice space. Mm-hmm. Really. But the making sure that you've talked to someone about the right structure that you should be in is probably the first step to mm-hmm. be yeah. to, to, to heading in that direction as well. And speaking of structure. What do you think? Okay, so we've got the ideas how to structure. We sort of touched on the transfer of wealth, but how do you structure client assets or retiree investments with the transfer of wealth to the next generation in mind? I mean, it's that, that, that's a bit of a doozy one to, to ask. It's being in what are the sort of assets that are going to be able to be transferred easily, I suppose, is, is, is an answer to that conversation. If, if, nobody wants, if nobody wants a crack at it, then I'll just keep on talking. <laughs> 
No, nothing. I'm uh, trying to think of yeah. the, any any issues or problems that are that are in that sort well, of thing. No, I think the the kids are one of the ones that are going to keep going up. But um... <laughs> yeah, no, no, that's that that's okay. I, I think that there is difficulties. It, it's it's a it's a conversation that might be better handled with. Um, a tax agent or someone who's mm. sort of in that in that space. Mm. Generally talking, we're the guys that are handling just that asset allocation space. Yeah. So let's not go too far down that. On that note, if there's anything else you want to talk about, otherwise I think that uh, it might be time to, sh- to close it off. Any last comments? No, no I'm all good, I think. No, no worries. We're definitely living longer. Enjoy it. <laughs> <laughs> Enjoy it. That's right. And I think that maybe that's something that's, that, that's missed out. Okay, there's so much of a focus. The idea of it is supposed to be able to make sure that your retirement is actually, you've heard this, Enjoy it, spend it. Yep. Don't don't think about it. I do like Matt. That might be the comment of the day. The last dollar mm. is on the last day. Um, if I've got any dollars left over, it's going to go on the fourth at Randwick <laughs> on a Saturday <laughs> and say good night. Um, the uh, thank you for joining us out there too, Matt Wacher, a CIO for Asia Pacific at Morningstar. Thank you very much. <laughs> <That's all right. laughs> and, and cheers for that, uh, Lucas Dipobe, um from Fidelity International. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Uh, I am James Whelan, Managing Director of Barclay Pierce Capital's Wealth Management Team, and you have joined us for the Ensemble Investment Podcast brought to you by Morningstar. Have yourself a great day.